what I want to do is try to inspire everyone today, not just educate you on quantum computing, but get you to really understand that we're in a very exciting moment in time in computing science. Quantum computing is going to change computing more in the next 10 years than it has in the last 100. And this is something I'm super excited about, which leads me to my first question that I get asked more than anything, which is, when will quantum computing actually arrive? You know, if you talk to some people, they think it's still 20 years away. Some people think it's commercialized today. Some people think it's three years. And so, you know, if you're on the pessimistic side of that, I believe you're probably wrong. I believe you should be preparing for this today. Already, there are many quantum computing uh, services that allow you to get algorithms, things like Chris does at Zapata, access actual physical machines from some of our other speakers, and generally to deploy this. Now, quantum computing is still in the early age. It's not AMD versus Intel yet. It's more like little mechanical gates versus vacuum tubes. But where did this all start and why am I so excited about this? When you hear Chris and Alana and Leone talk today, they're not speaking about this in the way most people look at quantum computing, which is, I just heard about it in the last few years, and because of that, it's pretty exciting, uh, but it probably takes a while. You have to go all the way back to 1927, the fifth Solvoy conference, where Schrodinger and Heisenberg and Einstein and many others came up with the idea of quantum mechanics. And because of that, you look at that and you say, well, 1927, 94 years ago, what have we done? Well, in 1980, Feynman and Benioff came up with the concept of using an atomic particle as a bit. So instead of, in the early days of computing, have the flow of electricity between the gates and having a binary system, you were able to use a block sphere, if you imagine a soccer ball, where if it's pointing directly up, it's a one. If it's pointing directly down, it's a zero. But you get all kind of different information in between. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But as Amit said, this is the space race of our generation. I believe that 100%, because to get to true AI, to get to some of the things we dream of in computer science, we need this new computational ability. And when you look at that, you think, well, what's the impact going to be for me? Many of you are students that might want to have job careers in quantum. Many of you are CIOs and CTOs trying to figure out how to figure where this fits into your enterprise. All of this is really important, but I think it's you know, much bigger than that. Um, how big? Well, I believe that we're about to enter a quantum age that compares and will rival the industrial age and the information age. So when you think about this, quantum mechanics won't just come into computing. It'll come into networking, sensors, many of the things you use. And as an average person out on the street, I may not actually use a quantum computer, but I'll get benefits from it. Google, for example, is investing so heavily in quantum computing primarily because it can do very fast, uh, fast search. For example, if you have a name and you have a first name, no last name, and a number, and you want to search through a directory, a, a classical computer would look line by line by line to find the answer. But a quantum computer would only need to use the square root of the number of entries to find that same answer. So there's many things. When we think fast, don't think fast as making the cat video on YouTube faster. Think of computationally complex problems that we have in environmental sciences, material sciences, drug discovery, where it's not that a classical computer can't do this work, it's just that it would take years. So for example, a lot of people use a traveling salesperson example. You know, if we took that, you want to go to 14 cities around the world? Well, that would take my Mac laptop about 1600 seconds to figure out the optimized path. But if we go from 14 cities to 22 cities, a difference of only eight, that same computer would take over 2,000 years. So it's this type of calculation, these problems where the evaluation time skyrockets when we add a few extra variables, that's where we're really going to see the benefits of quantum. Now, when I say it's a space race, I mean it's maybe more like an arms race. Countries around the world are investing billions and billions of dollars trying to build quantum workforces, trying to build their own machines, trying to build these industries within their countries, because this will be a tectonic shift in our computational ability. And it won't just affect things like you know, chemistry and drug discovery, it also affects things like finance, right? And so that's really important. Most of your companies, Goldman, other companies, JP Morgan, they all have quantum teams now. Most of your companies, Pfizer, Merck, et cetera, Bayer have quantum teams now. All of your defense contractors do. And so this is something that has gone from a nascent market to an actually blossoming market. It's very important. But what is a quantum? We talked about that block sphere earlier. 
How does that actually allow you to do computations? Well, think of it as a two-level quantum mechanical system that allows for superposition, meaning that we're not getting a binary answer, we're getting a probability of a one or a zero. And because of that, we can explore a lot more problem space in a much shorter time. So you take these qubits and you come up with the operations. And again, imagine a soccer ball, straight up is one, straight down is zero. We can go through and we can manipulate that to come up with the calculations we want. Now, that's pretty complicated. But for those of you who really want to understand it, maybe a more simple example would just say, take this coin I have. It has a heads and a tails. So if this is a classical computer and I put it in the palm of my hand and the coin is heads up, it's a one. If it's tails up, it's a zero. And in that space, it can only be one of those two options. Now, quantum computing, I take the same coin, I flip it in the air, and when it's the apex of that flip, is it a one or a zero? Maybe that's a good way to illustrate that it's in a probability of one or zero. And until that state collapses and we observe it, we don't know whether it's a one or a zero. Now, this makes a lot of people think that quantum computers are going to replace classical machines, and they're not. The way I like to think about it is we used to cross the United States uh, from New York to California on wagon, and it took weeks, and it was very dangerous. And then the train came along, and when you took the train, it took about a week. But no matter how far you go, eventually you reach an ocean. Think of classical computing more like trains and quantum computing more like air travel or maybe even space travel. So these don't replace each other. They work together. We still use trains all over the world for travel, but there's some places we can't go. We need planes. So you want to see in your infrastructure classical and quantum tightly interacting together. And I'll give you an example of a calculation to illustrate that in here in just a moment. We've all heard of quantum calculations, and one of the most popular quantum calculations is Shor's algorithm. And so Shor's algorithm, you know, just to put it specifically, is going to be something that will be possible once we reach, you know, true general quantum computing. But if you look at that calculation, let's think about it, and it'll really illustrate how classical and quantum interact. So the first step in this, when we're trying to factor this large number, is that we look and we say, you know, can we take an n is it an odd number? You know, it's two a factor. If it's not, we're going to go ahead and do it. We're going to use for this example, we're going to pick 15. And then in the second step, we're going to say, you know, here's a fast calculator algorithm. 15 is a product of two co-prime numbers. So that's awesome. We can then move on to the next step. And we can say seven is not a factor. It's a random number we picked, a 15. And then we get to the fourth step. This is where the non-deterministic quantum magic happens. Meaning that if I look at this entire algorithm, I could do steps one, two, three, and five on a classical computer. I could write you an iPhone app to find an even or odd number, tell you if it's a factor of a coprime. That's so fast, it would be a waste of time and money to run that on a quantum machine. But this fourth step, right, where you find the order, R of X mod N, is so complicated. Our classical infrastructure would take forever if it could even ever do it. And so that's maybe a good example of how you're not going to have just everything running on a quantum computer. You're going to have this binding between your classical infrastructure, your HP infrastructure you have, and your quantum infrastructure. And of course, if we look at the end of this calculation, if R is even and all holds true, then we can find the factors. Otherwise, we go back to the next step, pick a random number, and try again. So, you know, TLDR, 15 would be 3 times 5. Now, where will this stuff really take place? For me, it's going to affect all industries. Pharmaceutical, machine learning, optimization, search and finance, cryptography, data science and logistics, and so much more. But I'm interested in the real quantum future. There will be a point in time, post-quantum, where think of we go back in a time machine in 1963, and a guy named Jack says, here's a microprocessor. Nobody was thinking about the internet or autonomous vehicles artificial intelligence or any of these things. And there will be all of these new opportunities, I believe, when we get into that post-quantum world. Things we haven't even thought of, applications no one's even dreaming of today. And that's why the time to get involved in quantum is now, and that's why it's so exciting to be involved in this. Now, this space can be very complicated. People around the world trying to work on ways to build abstraction layers and make this more accessible. So at Strangeworks, we decided we would build a completely free way. And we wanted to understand what the problems were. So we built a community with Stack Overflow, Blue Cat in Japan, and a bunch of other communities around the world. And we found out what's the real problem. 
And the number one thing that many of you in the audience may feel is there's a lot of confusion. There's so many pieces of hardware. There's so many frameworks that you could choose from. We wanted to make that simple, give you access, build an ecosystem that was easily accessible, and help you train your quantum workforce today. And we wanted to do that for free. So we'd like to invite all of you to go to quantumcomputing.com and start playing with quantum computing today. It's a full integrated environment. You can write code in it. You can deploy to any of the simulators for free. You can deploy to some of the hardware for free. If your project is interesting enough, it's kind of a ticket uh, system. But it integrates all of the stuff from IBM and Honeywell, D-Wave, Getty, IQ, literally the entire universe of hardware and software applications, over 20, maybe almost 30 frameworks at this point. We just added another one uh, this week. So it's got a lot of members. Most of the people you've heard of, AWS, Hitachi, IQM, IBM, Microsoft, they're all a part of this. And again, this is a community effort to help kickstart your quantum computing adventure. We're not doing this to profit. We're doing this because we think quantum computing is one of the biggest fundamental shifts in computing to happen in its history. It is incredibly important that we all collaborate on solutions. This isn't a, a single company sport, a single uh, industry win. This is a collaborative effort, team sport. And so to that effect, we just announced this week that Ticket from Cambridge Quantum Computing uh, is now fully integrated into our system and they've joined the StrangeWorks Quantum Computing Syndicate. So with that, I'd like to answer any questions that the audience might have. And if you have a great question, we will present you with a free copy of Quantum Computing for Babies that I'll mail to you anywhere in the world. So with that, we're about 11 minutes in. We have a couple of minutes for questions. I'd love to hear anything that you'd like to discuss.